service started tonight. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity we had to be in your house tonight. We thank you, Father, for each one that's come out, Father. We pray now tonight, Father, as our pastor breaks a word of life with us, Father, it'll be a message we need to hear to help us to walk closer with you. Bless those round about us that are sick, Father. Pray you'll touch their bodies, restore their health, bring them back into the fold. Give us a good service tonight here, Father, for we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, let's all get a hymn book out now. Turn to page number 172. And we'll sing the first, second, and last verse of Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
turn to Ezra chapter number 10 and verse number 4. Are you glad to be in church tonight? Yes. I'm glad to see you. We're going to talk about courage and sharing the word of God. Courage in winning the world to Christ, soul winning. Encouraging others along the way. Now tonight, we're going to talk about courage in revealing God's purposed will. I'm very concerned today about the Christian world we live in. It's not what I remember when I was a kid. The Satan is not only working alive in the world, he's alive and well in the church. And he's trying his best to destroy the children of God, and he's, it's, it's working. I don't see the commitment I used to see. I don't see the extra mile Christians that I used to see. I see people making excuses. I see people evading responsibility. And it breaks my heart because God has a will. And they don't, people today don't seem to understand that if there's a will, there's a purpose. Are you with me? And if you miss God's will, you miss God's purpose. And if you miss God's purpose, there is no product in the end. Does that make sense to you? The job of the church is to encourage the brethren, teach the word of God, to encourage them to the excitement of service. But Satan has took that away from us. Satan's took it away from us. The cares of this life have overtook the work of God and the will of God. Now, it took a lot of courage for Jesus to reveal God's perfect will for his life. Now, stop and think about this for a minute. No one believed him. Most believed he was an illegitimate child. Most believed that. Most of the, especially the higher-ups believe that. The leaders in the synagogue, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. The rumor mill was running wild because they didn't understand. That's the problem today in the church. Is people don't understand how serious this business of God is. This work of God is, is serious business in your life and my life. We're all individuals, but we're all a team. Amen? We're all a team. Jesus had to stand when it wasn't popular to stand. And I'm telling you, it's not popular to be a Christian today. It's not, it's not popular to say, well, God's called me to preach. God's called me to be a missionary. When I was a kid, people were getting called to the mission field and preaching and, and, and full-time service every time you turned a corner. Now people are running from serving God or evading it altogether or trying to sidestep it. And they don't realize the cost that's involved in not stepping up to the plate and accepting the purpose and will of God for your life. The cost is men and women's souls for all of eternity. Katie met me in the parking lot before I after I dropped Wendy off, I was going to pick some folks up for church, and she called me and said, someone got saved this afternoon at our activity. That's the reason for what we do. That's the purpose for what we do. And I'm afraid we're losing that purpose. You say, well, preacher, we had three saved during revival. We had one saved today. What if we got our purpose right? How many more would we see saved? Amen? We've got to get back to our purpose. Now, it took a lot of courage because Jesus knew the disciples were immature, young, in, 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 in belief, and they would not understand God's path and God's purpose. And they didn't. <laughs> they didn't want to believe he was going to die. They wanted to believe he was going to come in on a white horse and take over and run the Romans out. 
and they were going to rise up and they were going to be the uh, uh, new leaders of Israel. They were going to rule and reign with Christ. They got a little bit ahead of the story. I'm afraid sometimes Christians get a little bit ahead of the story. You see, I taught in Sunday school this morning, and I'll tell you again tonight, the waters of affliction, they're there to make you mature. The bread of affliction is there to make you mature. But we're rebelling against maturity. We're rebelling against spiritual growth, standing for God. You can't let whether or not people understand you stop you from serving God. You cannot let people, what people think about you, stop you from obeying the will of God. Because in the world you live in today, they're not going to understand, and they're not going to accept it. Now, God's will is going to go one way, and man's understanding is going to go another way. I see that struggle everywhere in the Christian world. They think things go this way, but God says, no, read my word. That's the problem. Everybody wants to live in the fallacies and the foolishness of their mind when they ought to be living in the facts and the promises and the precepts and the principles of the word of God. We've got to have the word of God to know where to go and what to do. It's the foundation. If you're not following the Bible, you're, you're following the imaginations of your mind. And believe me, we've all got some wicked imaginations. Don't die on me in here tonight. Now listen to me. Many times when you step out for the Lord, everyone's going to misunderstand you and nobody's going to support you. That's what it's going to be. Many people will tell you you're answering the call of God's will upon your life. It's a mistake because it doesn't make sense to them in a natural and a physical world. Let me tell you something about God's will. It's never going to make sense to man never going to make sense to man. And so don't worry about what man thinks. It makes sense to God. Answer his call. If his call matches the word of God, step out. Step up. Step forward. Do something mighty for God. We're in the last days. The sand is running out of the hourglass. It took courage for Christ to reveal his plan because he was going to die. He was going to die at the hands of the enemy. To me and you, that just don't make sense. He should have rode in on a white horse and whooped up the uh, Romans and, and, and got a hold of the Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes and changed their minds and he should have started his kingdom right there. It wasn't time for that. God has a purposed plan, a purposed will, and that purposed plan and that purposed will has got to be followed. Look at Ezra 10.4. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage. And do it. Folks, I'm going to tell you something tonight's going to make some of y'all's hair raise up on your head. And some of y'all are going to go behind my back when church is over and we better get rid of him quick. He done lost his ever living mind. That's what they're going to say. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. If we don't start making some moves to get out on that land, we're going to miss the blessings of God. It's time to have courage. And what does those last two words say? And do it. And do it. Have courage. Have faith. Find the will of God and pursue it with all your heart, soul, and mind. I believe that to be true, don't you? Psalms 27, 13. And I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the what? In the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good. There's that word again. And he, God, shall strengthen your heart, thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Now, preacher, you just said do it. And now you're going to turn around and say wait. <laughs> Those are not my words. They're God's words. But I don't think he means wait and take a nap until he shows up. I think he means wait and work until the blessings come. Boy, if y'all going to, look, I can let y'all out early. We can stay here all night. It's up to y'all. 
You get it, we'll go. You don't, I'm going to sit here until I get it through. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. All right. Psalms 31, 23. Oh, love yourself. Most decisions are made because you love yourself, not because you love the Lord. If you love the Lord, you'll take a chance on stepping out on faith. You'll take a chance of being faithful even when it doesn't look plausible. Amen? Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the... <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I, I believe that verse in the Bible says, a faithful man, who can find him? Now, y'all are here tonight. Y'all are faithful. Say amen. Y'all can pat yourselves on the back. You're here. But let me tell you what's holding back the church of the living God, this church and every other church around, a lack of faithful people. We've got to be faithful. He said, the Lord preserveth. He didn't say pickle. Some of y'all look like y'all been in the uh, Mount Olive jar before you come to church tonight, sucking on them deal pickles. God didn't pickle us. He preserved us. Uh, that's sweet. See, so I done learned you got to find other ways in my household to get a hold of the sweet. My wife told me the other day, she said, I need a bag of monk fruit. I said, a bag of, a bag of what? Monk fruit. I said, we don't eat monkeys around here. She said, you stupid, it ain't fruit, my monkey. It's sugar made out of monk fruit. Now, honest to heaven, don't lie to this preacher. How many of y'all ever seen a monk fruit? Put that hand down, you lie. <laughs> two people. Rest of us is normal. Them two ain't normal, see? <laughs> I ain't never seen a monk fruit in my life. Never laid my eyes on one. But I've eaten some. Because you know how to find out monk fruit sweet. But it ain't sweet like sugar. So last night, we got to eat a salad because we on a diet. So I done watched Paula Dean make some homemade French dressing. I love me some French dressing. Say amen. Now, ain't nothing worse than bad French dressing. But it ain't nothing better than good French dressing. So we go and we buy all the stuff to make homemade. And you're supposed to put three tablespoons of sugar in that French dressing. Said I couldn't. So I got the monk fruit. So I put them three tablespoons of monk fruit in my salad dressing. Got ready to shake it up. You're using my monk fruit! It's like they had a heart attack. She said, I ain't gonna have enough for my coffee this week. I said, did you buy that bag? Yeah. I said, well, you can buy another one. <laughs> I had to put that monk fruit in that thing, shake it up, and boy, that was the best French dressing. Paula Dean's a smart woman. She knows how to cook. But I loved that dressing. It was good, and it went against my diet. Everything else was legal after I put that monk fruit in there. So I got French dressing home to eat my salad with, so I won't think I'm grazing like a cow in the middle of a forest somewhere. But that sweetness, we all have a sweet tooth to a certain extent. You've got to have something sweet, and that monk fruit works, so I guess I'm going to have to invest in monk fruit because I'm going to be eating a whole lot of it in the near future, i got a feeling. Then she made a apple sauce cake. Apple, no, fresh apple cake. And of course, it calls for sugar and flour. Ain't supposed to have either one. So, they say, get some almond flour. Well, I found a bag that had a slight heart attack. $14 a bag for that flour. $5 a bag for that monk fruit. I'm going to have me an expensive fresh apple cake. <laughs> but I'm going to have it. I'm going to have it because I'm going to use that almond flour and I'm going to use that monk fruit. And I, I look, the Lord preserveth the faithful. Where are you going with this preacher? Look. And plentifully rewardeth the proud, not of yourself, but of your Savior, doer. He rewards those who are faithful. And you know, it breaks my heart when I see God blessing the faithful. But then the unfaithful 
don't get the blessings. They get jealous of the faithful. And so they get jealous of them and turn green and get angry with the faithful. And then there's a fight in the church. <laughs> Craziest thing I've seen in my life. The unfaithful get jealous of the faithful and then they have a fight amongst themselves when they ain't got nothing to do with each other. The problem ain't here to here, it's there to there. And I want to say something tonight. If you'll be faithful and wait on the Lord, you'll do it. You'll do it. You'll get it done. What does it say? Be of good courage, courage and he shall strengthen grace your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. we got to get our focus, put him as our preeminence, put him in first place. We're never first. Others aren't first. God is always first. But you see, we've, we've slid away from that. And we think it's all right to be unfaithful to God. Let me ask you a serious question. How many times have you got to cheat on your husband or wife to be labeled unfaithful? Then why is it any different with God? Why is it any different? Why can you be unfaithful a hundred times to God and you're not unfaithful? Yes, you are. It's our definition of faithful and unfaithful. And evidently our definition of faithful and unfaithful ain't the same thing God's is. Or we'd be more what? Faithful. We'd be more faithful. And you've got to be faithful. And I'm going somewhere with this. You've got to be faithful because God's got a will. And if you're faithful to God and his will, God's going to bless your life and make something that will last past this life. It will last past this life. Let's look at Mark chapter 10. Back to Mark chapter 10, verse 20, 32. Got a glare up here. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were, can I, let's stop right here. Say, many notes don't cost you a nickel. If you follow Jesus, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be amazed. You just have some faith in God and do it, and you'll be shocked what God will do. You do a little bit, and God will do a whole lot. And that's good preaching, I think so. Amen, Walter, you're doing a good job. And Jesus went before them. They were amazed as they followed, but they were afraid. You see, people get amazed, and then the devil comes along, and they get afraid. They get fearful of where they're headed. God's doing great things. God's blessing. But then I'm a little nervous. Why are you nervous? Look who you're following. Look who you're following. You're not following a man, you're not following people, you're following the Lord. This passage shows us how the disciples were thinking in their minds and their hearts as they followed Jesus. And you know what? We're trying to follow Jesus. I am. How about you? You're trying to follow Jesus. Raise your hand. All right, some of y'all sleep. Wake up. Punch the one next to you and raise your hands. Amen. Hey, Jesus was leading the way. Jesus was moving forward in the will of the Father, the work of the Father, and the way of the Father. They were amazed and astounded that Jesus was moving ahead without fear or trepidation when their hearts were so filled with fear. Now, you're as nutty as a $3 fruitcake. If you don't know what a $3 fruitcake is, go buy one. You'll find out it's full of nuts. Ain't no fruit in it. Y'all will get that next week. Ain't no fruit in it. If you think that I'm not fearful about moving out down that land, you need your head examined. I ain't never built a building in my life. I ain't never raised money to build a building in my life. I've watched other people do it, but I ain't never done it. But is that an excuse to be afraid? Absolutely not. I'm trying to follow the Lord. And I know if I do what I'm supposed to do and I find the will of God and I do the will of God and I do my best at it, God's going to take care of the rest. Now look, I love y'all and I'm probably going to get shot for this too, but I've been shot before and I get shot again, so who cares? If we don't get out of this city, we're going to get swallowed up. This city doesn't know what's coming. 
when they build that hell hole up on that hill over yonder, we better be out in Pennsylvania County. And we, we, we better be out there where we're away from the riffraff, and where we can send a light up and try to get a bigger light than the casino. I'm really going to blow some of y'all's mind. I'm thinking about something I ain't never thought of in my life. But I, I am serious to think about on top of that new building, put the biggest light you ever seen in your life shooting straight up. So bright that the people, when they're over there gambling and they lose all their money <laughs> and they wreck the car and they're in jail because they've done some stupid stuff, they'll see there's a light out in the county and get them away from a wicked city. Say Amen. That's what we got to do, folks. We have got to realize we're near the end, folks. We are near the end. The sand's running out of the hourglass. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus knew his end was coming. That he would soon die, be buried, and rise again. And then 40 days later, what was he going to do? He was going to leave him for sure, and he was going to send to heaven. He knew where he was headed. They had no idea. God knows where we're headed. <laughs> We ain't got no idea yet. But we need to find out. That's where the excitement's at. That's where the reality is. They were filled with trepidation. And many times we find ourselves in the same situation as we follow the Lord. It takes real courage to follow Jesus. Now B, again he gives the account in verse 32b. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them of what things should happen unto him. Jesus decided he needed to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with his disciples. He was going to reveal to them what he knew was the will of the Father. He had to die for man's sin. There was no alternate plan. Now, in their little pea brains, and they had pea brains, believe me, they thought, he's just mixed up. He's, he's, he's having a bad day. There's no way in the world. That's not victory, dying and losing your life. Victory's coming in on a white horse, whooping the Romans and straightening out the Jews and taking leadership and running the world. Now that's winning. That's winning. No. They failed to realize sin was a real problem. Sometimes we fail to realize sin's a real problem. And we forget that soul winning is our number one call. So number one, you say, preacher, what are you trying to say? Look, unless y'all got me really fooled, unless y'all got me really fooled, there ain't no millionaires in this church. <laughs> there ain't none. And you can't get blood out of a turnip. So it makes sense to me unless some of y'all need to get right with God and come clean and give that million dollars. Uh-huh. What, what in the world are we going to do? Preacher, you say we're going our genre. Our pockets is empty. Somebody said, my wallet looked like an elephant sat on it. I wouldn't tell you who said that, but anyway, we'll go on. We'll go on. Y'all a dead crowd thing. I don't know if you're scared or asleep. I'm sure which one it is. So how are we going to do it? We ain't got no money. It's called catching fish. Soul winning. Jesus caught a fish and had a coin in his mouth. Amen or oh me. Win souls. Train them to serve God. Train them to tithe. Build the church. And God will provide the rest. Amen. Listen to me. It takes real courage to follow Jesus. And as he gives us account again, he's already told them once, what does that tell you? People are hard-headed. You tell them stuff, somebody said, when are you going to quit preaching the gospel? I said, after everybody gets saved. Because <laughs> some people are hard-headed and they won't get saved. What other messages are other than the gospel anyway? That's what we're here to do is win the lost, encourage the brethren. Then in with this heart-to-heart -heart conversation, things were going to take place that were not going to be changed. It wasn't going to be altered. God wasn't going to sweep down and change it as he walked to the cross of Calvary. 
the light, the sky wasn't all of a sudden going to light up and 10,000 angels destroy the world and set him free. It was not going to happen. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be beaten beyond recognition of a man. He was going to die, and they could not understand that. You see, God's will cannot be changed or amended. It has to be followed with faith and courage. Jesus said, this has to happen. I have to die. If you want to go to heaven and you want to escape hell and you want others to go to heaven and others to escape hell, I have got to go to that cross. I've got to shed my blood. I've got to die and I've got to be buried and I've got to rise again for all this to happen. You can't fight God's will. Number one, look at verse 33a, delivered. Saying, Behold, we shall go up to Jerusalem. We go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. Here Jesus was trying to explain to the disciples the pathway forward would take humility. The pathway forward, look, humility. Let me help you tonight. Do y'all love me? I love y'all. Can I help you? Humility is you zero, God everything. You zero, God everything. Jesus had to give the Father his whole life, everything. It was going to take humility. He was, he'd been in the throne room of God. He'd been in heaven. He's got all power. And he's going to let these people beat him and torture him and lie on him and accuse him and crucify him and kill him on a cross? Do you understand it took courage for Jesus to follow the will of God? It took courage. He laid aside his glory to be a man. He was just as much man as he was God. You say, I don't understand that. Well, join the club. <laughs> I don't understand it either. But I know one thing. He had to surrender to God's will. And you know what you mean you've got to do? Surrender to God's will. Listen, here the very Son of God would have to stand before the very men he created. Our flesh is not built on humility. We are pride-filled, arrogant, pompous human beings. Our flesh is rotten. Yet to fulfill the will of God in our lives, it's going to take submission and humility to, to walk the will of God in the way of the Father. We've got to stop thinking we know it all. We've got to stop wanting it all. And we've got to go say, okay, God, if you know the best route, let's go. It may look like a jungle. It may look like more than we can handle. It may be more than we can comprehend. It may be more than we can understand. But if it's God's will, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, listen to me. He's going to do something for you he didn't even do for Jesus. What do you mean, preacher? He turned his back on his own son when his son took the sins of the world upon him. But he said, because of what Jesus did. Boy, are you getting blessed? I'm getting blessed up here. This desk goes flying. Y'all better run because this fat elephant's moving. I'm getting blessed up here. Hey, Jesus took total humility to die for what you did and for what I did. And it took courage and it took humility to let the very creatures that he created take his life. If it took that for Jesus, don't you think that's what it's going to take for me and you? Total trust in God no matter where the road leads. And I'm telling you, in this life, some of those roads can get ugly. They get tough, straight up. I'll never forget one time I, some Star Wars movie was on and he was playing in Martinsville. And I had that old Dodge Spirit. Y'all remember that old Dodge Spirit I had? I done run this suit out of it. It was blue. I done wrecked it twice. Thing was hanging on by a thread. And the, 
green dodge spell. I had two of them because I wanted to always be in the spirit. <laughs> Y'all will get that later on. The green one was in the shop and I was having to drive that old blue one. And the kids wanted to see that movie on Star Wars and the only place it was playing was in Martinsville. And I don't know if Wendy remembers or not, but it, you ever been to the movie theater in Martinsville? That what? And I got to the bottom of that hill, and I said, y'all better pray. And I give that thing the gas, and that thing started, ah, woo, woo, woo. and the boys got nervous. They said, we ain't going to get to see the movie because we can't get up the hill. I said, boys, if we just get up the hill, we can get down. <laughs> we just get up there, we can get down, and finally, and that old beat up Dodge Spirit, we got to the top of that hill, and them boys went, Whew, that was close. That was close. That was an ominous sight trying to climb that mountain on that old Dodge. Look, me and you, the old Dodge. And we got some mountains to climb. But God said something to us he didn't even say to his son. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you can't say amen to that, your amen is broke. Oh, listen, he, he would be delivered. Now, number two, decree, look at verse 33b. And they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him unto the Gentiles. The end result would not be be what we considered victory. As a matter of fact, we consider it defeat. It was the worst case scenario, death. The road you're on, I love you, but the road you're on may look like the worst case scenario. But trust me, if God's with you, it's not the worst case scenario. If God's with you, it's not the worst. All this time, last this year, not last year, I spent a lot of time worried about myself. But God gave me the victory for myself. I got an email this morning from one of our missionaries. His wife is going to have her third chemo treatment. She's the same age I am. She's been very sick, very weak but doing well. She had 20 hot spots when they did her PET scan. I know what one of them is. She had 20 hot spots. I had one. She had 20. She took three chemo treatments, and now it's down to four. But he said in his letter, she's got two more treatments to go. That road looks scary. He wants us to pray for him. I think there are missionaries this week. Sergio and Linda Mahangos, she's got cancer. This is her second battle. You're not supposed to make it through your second battle. But God's people are going to pray her through. Amen. Because Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, listen to me. Deride it. Look at verse 34a. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him. The decree was going to be bad enough. The death decree from the judge was bad enough. But as he walked to that hill Calvary, they mocked him. They laughed at him. They derided him. Sometimes, listen to me, that dark road you're on, nobody else is going to understand the road you're walking. And they may even criticize you because you're on that road. Don't listen to them. Amen? Don't listen to the persecutors. You just keep trusting God. You put your faith in the Lord. You see, and death, the next part of verse 34b, and shall kill him. The end result would be worse than the path to the cross. He was trying to teach them that even when things are at their worst, God is still in control. Number five, defeat. And on the third day, <laughs> 
he shall rise again. Preacher, you did that message too late at night. That's the wrong word. It ain't supposed to be defeat. I know, preacher, you're looking for another D to go along with all your other Ds. But that ain't the right word. Yeah, it is. The devil got defeated. <laughs> Amen? The devil's the one got the surprise when it was all said and done. You've heard me tell the story. Day one, the devil comes by death. You sure you got him? He says, I ain't never lost one yet. Everybody's ever died has stayed dead, and they're going to stay dead. Day two, the devil comes around death. You sure you got him? He's dead, stone cold dead. He ain't moved in two days. <laughs> On around the end of the second day, he just happened to be by the air. He said, I'm going to stop one more time. Uh, death, you got him? He says, something's not normal. What do you mean, Death? Something ain't normal. This, this ain't normal. Something's going on here. I, I'm not sure. He said, Death, you better not let him go. I'm going to hold on to him. You ain't got to worry about me. I got him. Then the devil went back to where he was, and all of a sudden, at the rising and the setting of the sun, that's when Jesus rose. He didn't raise the sunrise. That's why they don't have sunrise services. He rose at sunset because the day started at 6.30. Sunday morning was 6.30 on Saturday night. Study your Bible. When the sun set, the Savior rose. Amen. But death come running, knocking on the devil's door. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be. He said, something happened. I couldn't hold him. He got loose. Hallelujah. Amen. Your road looks dark, dim, and dingy, but the sun's going to rise. The S-O-N. And he's going to rise for you. He's going to defeat the enemy. He wanted to assure the disciples, though the night be dark, that God would make a way miraculously. In a way that the enemy would be defeated and the Father in heaven would receive glory. The amazing truth about the Lord is all the story has been clear from the foundation of the world. Maybe not to me and you, but God made that foundation of the world. He made this plan, and he never messed one up yet. Say amen. He's never messed one up yet. Ken, skip down to C. Assured and assertive. Look at verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to the very place he knew he was going to die. Jerusalem. You realize Jerusalem means the city of peace, but he knew there was no peace waiting there for him. Pain, suffering, persecution, crucifixion, death. But he set his mind up to go to Jerusalem. The word assertive means confident, positive, decided, forward, self-assured. Jesus was all those things. He put all his eggs in the Heavenly Father's basket. He determined in his heart to please the Lord. Tonight, if I could get you to do one thing, if I can convince you scripturally to do one thing, it would be this. Just please the Lord. Don't please yourself. Don't please your mama. Don't please your daddy. Don't please your spouse. Don't please your boss. Look, get along with them. Do what you're supposed to do. But if they're going to stop you from doing what God wants you to do, don't do it. Do what God says do. Say amen. amen. Jesus knew his destiny. He knew the end would be worth all the submission and all the sacrifice. I'm telling you tonight, if you'll surrender to God and you'll sacrifice your time, talent, and treasure and life for God, it will be worth it after all. I'm only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do by the grace
grace of God I shall do. Amen? Edward Hale said that. And that's a truth tonight. John J. Chapman said this. Have plenty of courage. God is stronger than the devil. And we're on the winning side. Boy, we're on the winning side. I don't know how we're going to win, but we're going to win. I was watching that baseball game the other night, Wednesday night. Ain't it amazing the last game of the World Series on Wednesday night when we didn't have church? <laughs> Ain't that the grace of God? We had no idea when we sit the revival meeting that that was going to happen, but I sure was glad because I was watching that last game. And I'll tell you one thing, when they got that last out, that bunch of Atlanta Braves, ah, went crazy. And they won't even at home. It was in Houston. I thought it was the funniest sight in the world. Just a little handful of people down on that ball field hollering and screaming. Everybody else went home. <laughs> All them Houston people went home. They wouldn't stay there and celebrate with them. That's exactly the way the world's going to do me and you. They didn't need that crowd. They didn't care if we want nobody in the stands. We didn't want nobody on the field. They were world champions. They won it all. They didn't need Houston to be the winners. I'm telling you, man, you don't need the world to be the winners. All we need is Jesus. Stand to your feet. Father, I pray tonight as we give this invitation that, Lord, if there's some Christian here with a heavy heart and their lives look dark and dim, They'll just come to this altar tonight and say, Lord, here I am. I don't need Houston with me. I don't need Virginia on my side. But I need you. And you promised me something you didn't promise your son. That you'd never turn your back on me. Lord, help me trust you and believe you on that. And God, help me win this thing called life. Lord, help me go down these dark roads. I got to go down these scary hollers we got to go through and Lord help me hold your hand and you hold to me and get me through every step of the way God help me win this battle Lord help me win your will help me here when I get to heaven well done thou good and faithful servant enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Today's prayers are tomorrow's victories. God, help your people tonight not be afraid of this altar, not be afraid to bend the knee, not afraid to submit to the will of God, not afraid to come say, God, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I'm worried, but I trust you. I'm going to put all my eggs in your basket. God, if your people will come do that tonight, Today's prayers are tomorrow's answers. In Jesus' name. Heads and eyes are closed. God spoke to you. Now's the time to move. Now's the time. That's right. Come on. Let's fill these altars. Come, Come on. From every soul by sin oppressed, by the devil oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. Come ask God to help you win this thing. Trust him in his word. His word. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Today's prayers are tomorrow's answers. They're not pray, pray today. They won't be answered tomorrow. He will save you. He, he will, will save you. Save you.
Come on. I ain't got all day. You skinny. You ought to be able to get out of a whole lot faster than me. He's scared to death. Look at him. Go stand in that pulpit. Have you ever seen a cat, a long tail cat? See, I got a cat ain't got no tail. But have you seen a long tail cat? Have you ever been in a room of rocking chairs with a long tail cat? <laughs> That thing's nervous and tore up all to pieces. <laughs> he's preaching Wednesday night. And he's scared as a long tailed cat in a room of rocking chairs. He's looking down that long road of God's will and he's nervous. You can't see his belly like you can mine, but he's shaking. I can see it right here like a bird feeling <laughs> He's nervous. But y'all going to pray for him, ain't you? Amen. And y'all going to be here, ain't you? Amen. Okay. <laughs> you know what, Mike? I've known you for 22 years, and I've never known you to be an optimist till tonight. <laughs> now, man, you close us in a word of prayer. Right. Don't give us one of them zippos. You call on God and tell him to help you. Okay. You call on God and tell him to help them. Okay. And help you help them. Ten four. Because if you mess up, I'm going to sit on you. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, he's really nervous. Say that. <laughs> All right, man. He dismisses us in a word of prayer, please, sir. All right. Well, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for bringing us all here safe and sound, Lord. Thank you for bringing us into the house of the Lord and let us hear your, your word and, uh, allow, and allowing it to touch our hearts and our minds, Lord. Lord, we ask that uh, you give us strength to go out and touch somebody, Lord. Uh, give us the opportunity to minister to somebody this week. Um, Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for everything you're going to do in Jesus' name.